this. And so just so you know, I'll speak for a little while and then I'll just open it up to questions. So if you have questions, just hold them and then you can either write them in the chat or you can turn on your microphone and ask in person. It's totally fine either way. So that's what it's all about to me is being yourself. And everything and every real spiritual system is just a means of helping someone to that. And it's to find out truly what you love, what you are, and then it's to get rid of the barriers, the blocks that programming, society, trauma, wounds have, have put in between your capacity to A, see that, and to B, live that. And so that's what this is really about, is being yourself. And Kriya Yoga, as I practice it, and as I teach it, and as the other internal alchemies that I teach and practice, is about exactly that. And so then the question comes down to, who am I? And how do I know this? And once again, there's, there's a lot of very complex sounding um, explanations of this in different spiritual systems. And, and you know, to me, that, that just seems to be a means of intimidating the aspirant and separating them from the, from the leaders. And this is about self empowerment, you know, and so it really just comes down to what do you love, you are what you love. Period. That's all there is to it, you know, at least in this level of creation, you know, your heart is the compass it's the mechanism that lets you know who and what you are lets you know what you love. And it's really a barometer that I see more and more in the, in the new age world, people are talking about using their body as an antenna or using their body as a signaling device. If it doesn't feel good in the body, it's probably not for them. And if it does feel good, that's a sign. To me, that comes down even to the heart. Certainly there is a brain and there's an intelligence in the third chakra and the gut, but really the heart is the guiding principle. You are what you love, period. You know, so this is about finding that and then living that. And it's super, super practical. And we work with the physiology of the body you know, to achieve the results we're looking for. And it's very, very similar to getting in physical condition. You don't have to believe in anything. You just do the practices and see the results. If you're into fitness, you know, you go to the gym and you lift weights and you don't have to believe in the weights or worship the God of the weights or anything like this. You just lift the weights. If you're into yoga or Qigong or whatever, you do the practices. The results are the proof in themselves. Lifting weights, you get stronger. Practicing yoga, you become more flexible. You can better aerobic conditioning. You know, you become healthier. If you run or do you know, aerobic exercises, you develop your aerobic potential. And the same with this. If you do these practices, your life will evolve. Your life will change. You don't need to believe in anything. You don't need to worship anyone. And you don't need to give your power away to anyone. This is about, in the end, being you. So you need your power for yourself. Be your own guru to guide yourself in your life. And so you are what you love. Now, the heart chakra really is the key to this, and it's the key to living a harmonious life here on Earth. It's the center of the seven social chakras. There's three above and three below. Now, the challenge for a lot of people in this world is the drama, the trauma that's happened to them in past lives and in this one, because it's been a, this planet has been a traumatic place to live for a long time. And so we come in with wounds, and those wounds prevent us from being ourselves, prevent us sometimes even from seeing who we are. And so if you look at it right up the chakras, it's like following Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you study psychology. And the first is survival, right? The animal will leave the safety of its den to get food, to survive. You know, the second is sexual. The animal will leave the safety of its den to procreate the species. There's, there's a drive that's there. Third is the power center, which is also safety. They go hand in hand. And then, you know, if you don't feel safe, you're not really ready to, to live in your heart. 
So most people are trapped in these lower three chakras. Most people don't even know what's in their heart. They haven't even explored the concept. And living in this world that really takes us out of our hearts, tries to fit us into a structure, and really where most people on this planet are living in survival mode. That's, that's taking you down into the first or down into the lower three chakras. And so, you know, sadly enough, over half the people on this planet don't have enough food and water. I mean, that's ridiculous on a planet with this many resources. But politics aside, that's over half the people that are in a direct definition of, of um, a direct definition of survival. And then you can come to the first world countries like most people here are from. And most people like in the United States before COVID, I used to say this, you know, over half the people in, in what was supposedly the most wealthy country in the world, over half the people couldn't survive like a $500 emergency. That's survival mode. That's, you know, am I gonna make enough money to pay the rent? Am I gonna pay, make enough money to, buy the food for myself and my family. And you're really, your focus is 100% there. So even in a wealthy country, even if you have a nice big house, you know, you might be in survival mode. So then from survival is the sexual mode. And that's really, that's the empowerment. That's the creative energy. That's the energy that creates life, literally. On the, on the physical level, on the second chakra level, it creates a new physical being. Heart level, this is where you create your heart. Inspiration is bringing the energy down, bringing in spirit, literally, and bringing the energy up from the earth, mixes in the heart, and it comes out as your art, as your creative passion. Okay? And then the third chakra, so, so the second chakra is, this is the creative life force, but the religions have figured out, and politics have figured out a long time ago, if you want to control people, you got to control the sexual energy. And it's been repressed for thousands of years. You know, and this is a means of manipulating people. And if you want to understand that better, just look at modern marketing. Just go look at any advertisement painted on the side of a bus or a billboard or a TV commercial. Right? Because you can't appeal to somebody logically in 30 seconds. But you can imprint their emotional body, either with lust or fear usually right and so the message is look at the message you know this very attractive person you know using this product or even without the product anywhere in sight but the message is if you use this product you'll be sexually attracted if you use this product you'll find love so this is how that second chakra is manipulated and then the third chakra power or safety you know this is kind of fitting into your tribe this is the capacity to be yourself and you know, we have a saying that the tallest nail gets hammered first. And that means like, don't stick your head up too high because you're going to get hit. You know, just be quiet, conform, fit in, and everything will be okay. All right, so this is how, generally speaking, these chakras are used to interfere with the capacity to live your truth, to live in your heart. Now, individually speaking, I'll just give you an example. You know, if somebody wants to be an artist, let's say, but they came from four generations of attorneys, everybody in their family has been an attorney since, you know, 200 years ago, 150 years ago, right? And then one person decides that, um, that they want to be an artist. Now, what's going to happen? The first thing, survival. Like, will I make enough money as an artist to survive? You know, instead of being an attorney. So the survival fears come in. Secondly, you know, sexuality. Will I, you know, will I be able to attract a mate if I'm an artist and not a attorney? And then finally, in the safety and power. You know, will my family, will my tribe, my friends, you know, all of my colleagues who are all attorneys, will they accept me? Or will they laugh at me and kick me out? And so this is how 
you know, those lower three fears, even set for somebody who knows who they are in their heart, and they know that they want to be an artist, they know that they want to create. This is how the lower three chakras interfere. And then those fears in those lower chakras, did they come from this life, a trauma in this life, from where they were programmed in this life, or did it come from a past life, or a combination? So that's really, to me, what this, this Kriya Yoga, this internal alchemy is about, is using that energy to activate your awareness, to expand your awareness, so that you can open up the heart and know what's in there and feel that, and then clear out the inhibitions, clear out the, the wounds, clear out the traumas that are impeding your progress. Because how many times have you found yourself on this repeating cycle where over and over again you do the same patterns over and over again you uh you know it may be a different job but your boss always treats you the same it may be a different relationship but your partner always has these these parts that drive you mad you may have a the same living situation but your your housemates are always the same kind of person it's like why do you end up in these repeating patterns and it's because of these traumas that have been buried into your emotional body. So what we do with the internal alchemy, the Kriya Yoga, and especially the Tantric Kriya Yoga, is take this powerful energy and transmute it to spiritual energy and bring it back down into the field. And when we do that, it begins to fill those circuits and fill your energy bodies with energy. And as it does that, it pushes out the emotional debris and it brings it up to be seen and to be processed. So many times I've seen people who were traumatized as a child and they'd compartmentalize it and completely forgotten about it. And all of a sudden they remembered, oh my goodness, this happened to me when I was five years old. And that's why I act this way. You know, and it can happen to adults too, a car accident or some kind of, you know, there's some brutal things happening in the world to adults also. So what happens to traumatize people and then keep them repressed in this small space and not feeling, for many cases, not even feeling that they can, you know, have even have the right to be themselves, much less, you know, to know who they are and to do that. So that's really what these practices are about. And then the tantric, the tantric expression of the Kriya Yoga is really the most potent to me, because that incorporates the feminine energy and that incorporates the sexual creative life force. And the feminine energy is ignored in most spiritual systems. You know, they're just talking about the masculine energy and going up here and being one with God and being out in the cosmos. And, and if, the, if the feminine energy is, is um, if there's any attention paid to it at all, it's as a, um, as a danger. You know, this is going to distract you from your path. You know, this is going to lure you away. And so, if anything, it's, it's looked to be excluded. Whereas in the tantric system, it's about balance. It's about balancing the masculine and feminine and that incredible power that comes out of that. Because the feminine, you know, the Latin word for mother is mater. And the Sanskrit word for mother is mater. And that's the root of the word matter. You know, this physical world that we live in is matter. That's the mother, right? And so you can go up there and have all this incredible inspiration, but if you don't have the feminine, it's not going to express. You know, it's going to live in this abstract space. You know, just like physically speaking, you know, you can, men, you can become as aroused as you want, but if there's not a woman, you're not going to make a baby, you know, and that's really how it is. And so this, this balance of the masculine and feminine is, a, is, to me, the most potent way of living spirituality here on earth, you know, because you can go up and experience the awareness. You can experience spiritual inspiration. You can experience spiritual levels of creation. But then you can come down here and live that reality in a physical body, in a fulfilling abundant life and that's what it's all about to me is it's not just you know in most religions it's like paying it forward until someday you get lucky and die and you can go to heaven or whatever that is and get your reward right 
And here it's like, you're using it here and now to live this life. But the truth of that life, once again, it's not wearing robes and turbans and crystals and having pyramids and all this. It's about being yourself. No matter how chaotic or wild or crazy or peaceful and relaxed that may be. It's about being you. I don't care if you're a rodeo bull rider or, you know, as you know, somebody who builds Zen gardens. It's does that fill you with passion? Does that fill you with joy? Because that's really the greatest thing you can do for the world. What most people say to me, you know, what most people ask, like, you know, what can I do to make this world a better place? And my response is always start with you. You know, if one light bulb in the room gets brighter, the room gets brighter. So don't worry about the other light bulbs. Make yourself as bright as possible. And by doing that, you're going to make the world brighter. And on a real tangible level, it's a frequency thing. As you raise your frequency, by definition, that raises the frequency of the collective. But also when you're in that, and the HeartMath Institute has proven this, and it's shown scientifically, when you're in that moment of coherent, coherence in your heart, your energetic structures stack out in a phi ratio, golden mean ratio, which is back to sacred geometry, and you embed harmonically into creation and then you develop the power of creation behind you because you're embedded into the flow of creation and a very good analogy of that is you know a river that's flowing you know a stick will float down that river with the using the force of that river to take it downstream okay you can get in that river in a canoe or a boat and you can row and you can row with enough strength and row upstream because you have strength but you can turn it around and row downstream. And so you've got the same power that that stick does with it, the water carrying you downstream added to your power and your conscious intent. And you can steer, and you can accelerate. So this is what I mean by you have the power of creation behind you when you're embedded into creation. And synchronicities happen and magic happens and, and things begin to flow much more easily when you're embedded in creation. And that, when I say embedded in creation, it comes from that coherence in the heart. And coming, the co coherence in the heart comes from living your truth, being you. The fantastic fulfillment that comes from doing your joy, whatever it is, whatever makes you bubble with passion. And usually you can take one or more of the things that make you bubble with passion and use them to generate an income. And the income can be good because if you're doing something from that place of passion, you're going to be good at it. And that's what it's about is being yourself and finding that joy. So one of the things I suggest to people are like, I don't know who I am. What would you do? Like if you had 10 million euros or $10 million in the bank, what would you do with your time? Maybe you go party for a while. Maybe you go travel the world. But when that's done, what would you do just for the joy of doing it? That's a clue. Where do you go when you daydream? When you're sitting at your desk doing something boring or looking out the window or going for a walk, where does your mind go? That can be another clue. You write down a list of all the things, no matter how small, eating pizza, all the way to you know, designing skyscrapers anything you know figuring out a cheaper way to get to the moon anything what fills you with pleasure and then go back and look at that and then figure out how to incorporate as many of those things in your life as possible because i'll tell you right now when it's time to drop your body you can't take your money with you your car your house you know you can't take any of that with you what you can take with you is your experiences and your experiences are the real value in this life so when you drop your body, very few people, when they reach the end of their lives, and I've seen these interviews with these 90-year-old people, hey, what, would you, what would, advice would you give the younger people? Never, ever, ever did I hear one of them say, I think you should spend more time at work. I wish I'd spent more time in the office. You never hear that. You hear, spend time with your family. Go for more walks. Enjoy yourself. Do what you love. And so now is the time before you're 90 to think about that and go, hey, 
what am I going to do? Because when you drop your body, all you have to take with you are your experiences. Because in the end, that's really what we are, is aggregates or collections of experience. You know, we're not this physical body. That's just a tiny little part of us. It's more of a vehicle. And when you go from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime, in the space between lifetimes, what comes with you is the experiences that you've had. And they may be erased from this part of your memory, but they're still there in the long memory. They're still, and, and part of this expansion of awareness is to access your eternal self and know who you are. And then the other pages that you've written in the book of you become available. But that's really all that, that you are, is a collection of experiences. You're not a collection of things. You're not a collection of bank accounts. You're a collection of experiences. And then the only real litmus test, the only real way of discriminating is, is this, as you make your choices in life, is this experience, you know, which of these experiences is most in alignment with my heart? Which of these potential experiences is most in alignment with who I am? Because really life is a fractal. It's just these eternally dividing, you know, every time you make a choice, you know, there's, there's infinite possibilities in front of you. And every time you make a choice, if we're looking at it from quantum physics, all the other possibilities collapse. And then a few seconds or a few minutes or a few hours later, there's another choice. So you're literally creating your life as you go by the choices you make. But the only choices that are really in alignment are the ones that are aligned with your heart, with who you are not with what your mom wants you to do or what your preacher or what the television or what the authorities said or what, I, what you saw on a TV commercial or if I buy this thing, it's gonna make me happy even though I hate my job. It's none of that. It's you know, what's gonna bring you the fulfillment. What's gonna, what's gonna, when you drop your body, what experience are you gonna to wanna to take with you? And that's a super, super way to let you look as you make your decisions. Because in the end, you know, the only real currency that you have to spend is time in this three-dimensional awareness here you are moment to moment until you get and you're allotted a certain amount of it you know we don't know what it is but sooner or later your time in this physical body is going to end and that's the only currency you have that you can spend so how are you going to spend that time trying to please somebody else you know trying to please some a boss or you know an authority figure a friend an acquaintance impress the social people in your network it's about being you and that's the only value is living your truth then you're getting the richness out of every moment when you drop your body you can do it with a smile knowing that you got everything you could out of this life and when you drop your body you want to look at it and go wow i wish i'd done more of this but i was afraid to I was afraid I wouldn't make enough money. I was afraid, I, you know, I wouldn't have a mate. I was afraid that my friends would laugh at me. Yeah. Live your truth. That's what it's all about. And that's what being spiritual is. The word Tantra literally means liberation through expansion. There's a whole bunch of, I think, mischaracterations about Tantra out there or, or little pieces of Tantra that are being called Tantra instead of the incredible holistic body that it is because it's an incredible spiritual system but part of it it means liberation through expansion so technically anything that liberates you frees you from the bonds of your your uh, your awareness the bonds of society the bonds of the program you know, breaking out of the matrix if you will so that you can expand your awareness. That's Tantra. Doesn't have to be sexual. Doesn't have to be meditation. But Tantra is liberation through expansion. So when I talk about starting at the heart, you know, but expanding your awareness, this is partly what I'm talking about with Tantra. So that, you know, as you develop yourself, you begin to see more and more and more of yourself. And the, and the, parts of creation that you can access from other parts of you. So, um, excuse me. 
So when you talk about what's valuable, what matters in life, it helps to, and, and when we look at the craziness that's going on right now, it helps to put things, for me, it helps to put things in perspective. Because right now we're living, it's a beautiful jewel of a planet that we live on. It really is amazing. But that planet circles around a pretty impressive sun. That sun is one of 300 billion stars in this galaxy, at least 300 billion. And there's hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. And who knows how many universes there are in the cosmos, right? And what's beyond the cosmos. So when we look at what's happening on this little planet at this, at this little point in time, how, how much impact on the all of creation does that have? You know, we kind of build up this level of importance in our mind, and that's part of the program to get you to, of the control is to get you to focus in a small way and to create fear, because when you're somebody who's in their heart truly is empowered and can't be controlled. You're in fear, can be controlled. You can be manipulated, and, the, and your power can be taken from you. Okay? So when you look at that huge creation and know that you're part of that, and that as you expand your awareness, you're really just expanding your awareness to other parts of you that exist in that huge creation. So this is a chance to step out of that small space and to rethink your life. And then here's tools to do that, because I can't do the work for you. That's not what this is about. One of my mentors would say, life is a do-it-yourself project, you know? And that's part of what I love about this, is this is the guru-less science, the guru-less art. There's no gurus other than yourself. And this is, you know, I can give you tools. It's just exactly like getting in shape, you know? Someone can teach you how to lift weights, but they can't lift weights for you. Your teacher goes to the gym and lifts weights, you don't get any stronger. Right? You got to go to the gym and lift weights or run or do yoga or whatever it is. So this is about self-empowerment. And this is about me helping you develop your capacity to be you. Because that's a beautiful jewel. Whatever it is, whoever you are, is a beautiful jewel. You would not be created otherwise. And every note in the symphony is just as important as every other note because they all play off of each other. And for you, it's really not just your, your right, it's really your responsibility to be you, to live your truth, to share that with others. Because to live other than your truth is to go against why you were created. So all this baloney that's being spread by the authorities wanting you to conform and fit in and obey, that's totally against the truth of why you were created. Your job is to be you. And the only way that you can help this world is to start by being you. Because if you're not, instead of flowing with that river, you're putting, it's like putting a big stone in the river and it causes all these eddies and ripples and white water and undertow instead of this harmonious flow, because you're not flowing with life. You know? And so if you really want to change the world, it's not giving money to Greenpeace. You know, it's, it's going to be about being yourself, raising your frequency, embedding that frequency into the whole, which will make it more harmonious in a local way and in the entire field. And this has been proven through quantum physics, your impact on the whole. If you change one, one node in the web and the whole web changes. It's incredible how we're in, intertwined and how these new modern expressions of physics are proving ancient truths that we've known for thousands of years. You know? And so the most important thing you can do is be yourself. Now, once you become fully yourself and part of who you are is helping others, helping the environment, helping, you know, socially helping people learn to meditate what have you if that's who you are so be it but i don't care if you're if you, you know being a fisher 
fisherman or fisherwoman is, is what your passion is and you never see another human being. You just go out and fish. That's your passion. That will make the world a better place. You never see another person, but you live in your heart and that glow of fulfillment is radiating from your heart. You will make the world a better place. Far more than being unhappy and giving millions of dollars to your favorite charity. That's a cop out. This is about being you. It's the work of breaking through the programming, facing the shadows, facing the fears, overcoming the programming, overcoming or ignoring the ridicule of your friends or your so-called friends as you step out of the tribe and step into your real you. That's what this is about, is being you. So whether I ever see you again, <laughs> whether you take my classes or not, I hope that's what you take away from this. That you and your uniqueness is a gift to the world. And your responsibility is to be you. And like I said, it's not just a, it's not just a, a right. It's a duty and a responsibility to be you. And, and this is how we were created. It's amazing. You know, these religions are so many times so far backwards. It's amazing. We were created that the best thing that we can do for the world is be fulfilled. That's a cool creation to live in, right? Right now we're told that if it feels good, it's sinful. And if it's painful, it's holy. That's crazy. Even if that was real, that's not the kind of God I would want to hang out with. Create a world so that people can suffer and prove they're, prove they're holy. No, that's, and that's not the way it was set up. It was set up that you are what you love. The more fulfilled you can be, the better it is for everyone. In this world of infinite energy, infinite potential, the more you fulfill yourself, you don't have to sacrifice yourself. That's a lie. Be fulfilled. Have inner and outer wealth. Joy bubbling from you. That will make, just try it. Walk down the street and just smile and smile and see how many people smile back. And that's just share and joy on a little level, you know? But if you're fully radiating, you know, even like I said, if you never see another human being, you're, you, but if you're fully radiating that joy, that fulfillment, it's gonna make the world a better place. So this is, and it's beauty, that's part of what I love about the Tantra, you know? Using passion, using love, to generate energy and, and then transmute that energy into spiritual energy and to grow and expand through this incredible development of your capacity to love, to, to build love, to share love, to receive love. That's, that's really, that's the world I want to live in. That's, that's the way it was created. The more of that love that you can generate, the better the world is. And in Tantra, it literally is. I mean, literally is making love, right? Think about those words, make, you know, love to make. Like if I make breakfast or if I make a, you know, firewood, it's, it's, it's like doing something to create a result. Making love is the same way. Because the sexual energies, and there's a difference between sex and making love, you know, and, and in making love, you take that sexual energy, that orgasmic energy, and you transmute it up to the heart where it becomes unconditional love, or you transmute it up to the crown where it becomes spiritual love. And so literally you've made love. You've taken sexual energy and turned it into a higher frequency love energy. And when you finish making love, there will be more love in the world. You will have impacted the field. You will have impacted the collective, right? So that's the beauty of this. And then you can use that energy for healing emotionally, physically, healing others, self-defense, spiritual growth. So that energy is basically fuel that you can direct consciously wherever you need or choose. And so this is, this is part of the power. It's about being you and using the faculties that you were born with. That's why I tell people, you know, I don't have anything against them, but if you needed crystals, you would have been born with them. If you needed a copper pyramid to meditate in, you would have been born with one. If you needed a drum to grow spiritually, you would have been born with one. 
you know, all those things are cool. I'm just saying that you're born with everything you need. And the biggest thing is the capacity to love, the capacity of choice. So that's what this is about to me. It's about being yourself. And then everything else is just means of either helping you understand it, like the words that I just said, or making it happen. The practices that are there to help clear out and heal the wounds, to help you see more clearly, to understand better until you activate these higher parts of your being and you can see what other parts of your being. So it's literally, once again, liberation through expansion. You expand in the perception mechanism, you expand your world. You know, so this really, that's why we call it the spiritual science, it really integrates well with particularly quantum physics. So that's, that's really what I have to share for today as far as just a, an initial discourse, but I am here. If anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to, to answer. <laughs> I can see Geraldine already leaning. <laughs> Yeah, that does explain a little bit about your flat head because I've seen you stick it up many times in this life and <laughs> get it pounded on. <laughs> Geraldine's a friend of mine from like 12 years back and she can tell you cocoa breath and Kriya yoga stories. And Katarina, it's like three or four years now that we've known each other. It's been a while and she's been practicing these things as well. So if anybody has any questions, now is the time. Is it okay so, to unmute? Is it okay to unmute? Yeah, to ask? Absolutely. So what I ask is that you uh, unmute, ask your question, and then mute it again um, while I answer. And then if you have other comments, you can just do that. Otherwise, if you're shy, you're welcome to type your questions into the chat box. Okay. So I have a, a short observation for myself to share, and then the question. Okay. The observation about, especially the last couple of years have about letting myself fall into whatever I feel I am at the moment has mm -hmm. just been chaotic because of all the decades of suppressing whatever might be coming up about who I am. So the interesting thing to be watching the last couple of months is that being able to drop to the sort of that base level, that's been falling apart to slowly start to allow what that true essence is. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of my spiritual practices <laughs> decades ago, it was all about suppressing all of those things that I am. <laughs> right. The last couple of years has been, oh, cool. Let's just mm -hmm. cause chaos and be who I am. And then as that got to express, it's like, oh, that mm -hmm. energy got ran out and now it's like, oh, this is underneath that. So I'm in that next layer of the onion. So it's been very enlightening and exciting. Um, yeah. So my question in relationship to that, who is Krishna <laughs> in relationship to Babaji and the whole spiritual family? Um, some synchronicities have happened that this being has been popping in the last two weeks. And I just found out since I started seeing him, it was his celebration of his birth. And he, in many manifestations, he's very, 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 very feminine. And it's all about sexuality. So I just wanted to com you know, comment on that if you know anything about Krishna in this process. Okay, so let me first comment on your comment. Okay. And I'm, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mute. I'm gonna mute. Okay. Okay. Because that was yeah, that was very poignant. And a lot of people that, that goes back to the you know the beginning of your process. It sounds like what, what I was talking about, where a lot of people have an image of what it means to be spiritual, and then you know anger is not a good thing, so we have to suppress it. And fear is not a good thing. And sadness is not you know most spiritual people aren't sad. So we repress the parts that we think are not spiritual instead of letting that express come up to be either healed and released or to be integrated into your being. Because some of us are chaotic. I mean, sunyata, I mean, I mean, every culture has an expression of the spiritual chaos 
you know, whether it's the fool in the West, the divine fool, or whether it's the coyote in the Native American tradition or Hanuman in the Hindu tradition, there's always that, that being that like everybody thinks is crazy, but it turns out that they're really spiritual. And it's and Sunyata called us the chaos brothers. And it was because I don't know that he ever wore, except for like for initiation, like proper Hindu clothing and all that stuff, or, or tried to fulfill an image, you know. Um, and it was just always being ourselves. And that he's like the creator made the chaos brothers and sisters to show everybody like that it's about being yourself, that it's not about fitting the image because Here's somebody who goes completely against the grain of the image, and yet it's pretty obvious to you that they're spiritually evolved. And if you go to Sundance and you see the coyotes out there, they're they're respected by everybody, you know. And it, in the in the fool, you know, in in the Western tradition, so that chaos is there. And as far as part of what you talked about, like where it's starting, the chaos is starting to go away, and. The, the, you're starting to settle into a more of a coherent space. And it, and my image of that on the physical world is cymatics, the science of cymatics, where uh, maybe people have heard of it, maybe you haven't, it's where you project sound into a medium. Sometimes they use water, sometimes they use mushroom spores or very, very light me medium. And you project sound into that medium and it makes a shape. And then you raise the frequency of that sound and it goes into chaos. And then when that sound reaches another harmonic frequency, it goes into an even more beautiful, more complex shape. And then again, you raise that frequency and it goes back into chaos. And then it becomes an even more complex shape, and more beautiful. And that's exactly how creation is made, eh? both with sound, but also that frequency. There's, there's the harmonic of an individual dimension and then there's the chaos between dimensions and there's the harmonica of a higher frequency next dimension. But this happens in our lives as we're going from one level to another, there's a chaotic period. And that can be uncomfortable for a lot of people until you get used to it, you know, until you get used to like riding the river instead of you know standing on solid ground all the time. So as you go through that period of chaos, it's like, oh, I don't wanna meditate anymore or whatever. But actually, that's a good sign because it means that you're going from one level to another level and there's that undefined space and things are called into question and that which is not really you, it's a good chance to let it go away. And then the new, the new level of coherence comes and it's even more beautiful, and more complex and you're like, why was I ever worried? And then you start again and you get worried again, right? But anyway, so that was beautiful. Thank you very much for Geraldine for, um, for bringing that up. Um, as far as Krishna is concerned, I cannot give you a really deep answer because that's not my world. Um, I know that Krishna, you know, very little bit about it, a creator deity. Um, the reason the color is blue, no, that's she, never mind. So, yeah, so that's really all I can say is that it's, he's a creator deity of the Hindu pantheon. and. A Vedic scholar, like somebody sitting near me here, might have more to say about that. But um, but uh, but that's not my that's not my area of expertise. I studied enough of that to see that the same energy and symbolism, like I you know talked about Hanuman and the fool and the coyote, etc. You know the same. To me, it, it, all the religions are really just different languages saying the same thing, and so the Krishna energy is is a different expression of that creative energy, but I can't give you, I can't give you a, a, an in-depth explanation of who Krishna is in, in like the Hindu perspective. I, I think I was curious if Babaji, he ever came up in relationship <laughs> to Babaji. I'm sure it's another manifestation of just- uh, As far as like Babaji, which is like literally the great father. Yeah. I think that, that that would be, if you would want to look at that as an expression, you know, you see, you're even here and seeing writings where Babaji is giving honor to Krishna, you know, okay. and so Babaji came in as a human incarnation and then developed himself to attain physical immortality, 
-hmm. and then to be able to you know quote laugh at the limitations of death and to be able to change um, dimensional levels at will at least to a certain point mm -hmm. um, but my understanding yeah, but Krishna is then seen as a deity or which are to me are, are more like um, conscious embodiments of elements of nature that yeah. sounds yeah. Yeah. and when I say elements of nature I don't necessarily mean like the spirit of the the willow tree I mean, right. like creation cosmic creation and that kind of thing Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anybody else? Food for thought? All right. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining the first one. This is our first ever online satsang. And, you know, we've put a lot of time and effort into creating a new website and as it always is, there are there are some bugs in the website that we're working through with um, the designers and the and the host. And once that's done, then then the short version is I'll be able to communicate more, and uh, and there will be there's going to be an online community that people can communicate and express themselves and share and ask their questions. And this has been set up as a means because I've created the online program because I'm finding that as a that I have my own passions in this world and there's so many levels that I want to help on and, and work on and one of them is to me the solution to everything really comes down to consciousness. You know and Einstein and a lot of people like to quote Einstein you've probably seen it in Facebook, you know you can't some problems can't be solved from the level of consciousness which created them right. And a lot of people like to quote that but it's like okay, how do we change our consciousness and that's what this is about. Because to me, like I said, you shift your consciousness, everybody shifts their consciousness to the heart or above. You know, you've already made the world a better place because these the challenges in the world come from the lower three chakras, right? You know, survival fears and power fears and sexual fears, etc. So if we shift our consciousness because we have all the technology. We have all the logistical skill. We have everything we need to create a world of abundance for everyone. And I don't mean like enough food. I mean, beautiful homes and healthy food and fulfilling lives. I mean, we've destroyed enough to feed and clothe and house everyone many times over just in the wars in the last century, you know, since, since World War I, not to mention other waste. So it's all there. It's just how we're choosing to use it. Are we going to use half of our resources to try to steal the other half of the resources, or are we going to use half of our, all of the resources to make more resources? And I don't mean communism or socialism. I mean, because that's all childish. It's about consciousness is about how we live and how we make our choices. And, and so that's, so, so to me, sharing these practices, is the first step in evolving consciousness and gandhi said be the change you want to see in the world right and so if you do the practice if you change yourself it's going to make it easier and make the world better for everyone so that's where i start but my other passions are permaculture regenerative farming healing the soil providing healthy food setting an example to people that here's how you can live in harmony with the earth and, and be in a in true financial and material abundance, as well as emotional and spiritual abundance, you know, to create community to demonstrate that in a larger scale. So these are other passions that I have. So as much as I enjoy traveling the world and teaching, I've created an online program to take part of that. But there's also the everybody needs the personal touch because by the time you get to, to me and by the time you get to these teachings, you're in, you're individuated. And so you're, you know, each of us has fears, but everyone's fears are different. So each of us has challenges, but everyone's fear, challenges are different. And so I've created this satsang as a means of being there to answer people's questions, to communicate directly, you know, as you as you proceed through life. I've also created, um, well, we've been doing it for a while, an online meditation where once a week we, are, we get together. And, and we've had people from like 12, 15 countries joining at different times. Um, 
to meditate together and create a group field and to give group support. And then we're also creating some online support groups on Discord, Facebook, etc. So I'm expanding this and, and this so this is the first of these satsangs and we just got the website going a few weeks ago and like I say we're still working through the bugs and right now I can't edit <laughs> to add the new events that we have until uh, until we figure out what's going on. So if anybody out there is a WordPress designer, let me know. Um, but that's that's really what this satsang is about is is being there long helping create community helping you see each other ask questions if you know somebody who is interested in it they can come get a chance to taste whether you know i'm their cup of tea or not and whether this work is for them but also once people have joined to be able to um to be able to um access me for questions to bring up their issues their challenges etc and then we go from there Geraldine asks, where am I teaching next? My next class is going to be in Lisboa, Portugal, presented by that beautiful young woman right there, Katarina, who took my classes in Vienna and then so graciously moved to Portugal so that I could come visit her. And uh, <laughs> so, yes, coming up in mid September, I'm teaching in Portugal. I'll teach. Um, a tantric class called multidimensional lovemaking in the middle of October in Austria. And then in January, I'm teaching the initial, you know, the level one class again in Key West. So it's a level one class in um, Portugal. I'll be teaching the Cobra Breath Initiation in Rochester, New York, and in Vienna. So that's in October, November, December, no classes, and then January in Key West. And I'm open to going just about anywhere where people, you know, if there's a large enough group to make it worth my time to, to leave other projects and go, I'll teach just about anywhere. But in the meantime, the online program really is, and there's actually, it's really beautiful. I mean, it was so well, students of mine who are, who are adept at editing videos and, and these kind of things really took my crude recordings and turned it into a really beautiful course. And the, the questions, you know, the, the, the videos come directly out of my in-person teaching, but it's put together in a really beautiful way. And the, the advantage of the online course is when you are taking the course in person, you get it all in two days. And ask anybody who's taken my class, there's a lot of information put out in a very short amount of time. And I've had people take my class three, four, even someone's taken it five times. And they say they get more out of it every time because there's just so much information put out so if you have this online course you get access to it for six months and so then you can um watch it as many times as you want in that six months and you get to keep the the pdfs and the meditations the advantage to the in-person course is like you're right there with me you get to ask questions you get to feel the field you get to you know, you get the benefit of other people's questions. You, you get to, you know, so there's there's value absolutely in the face-to-face -face engagement, but I would say you're not missing anything if you take the online course. Now, the second level course is, is Cobra Breath. It's Kriya Kundalini Pranayama is the, is the technical name for it. And people ask me a lot of times, is this Kundalini Yoga? Yes and no. I mean, this is a yoga of Kundalini, but it's not the the, the uh, Sikh system called Kundalini Yoga. This is Kriya Yoga, and Kriya Yoga is Kundalini practice. And the base practice that came from Babaji is the Kriya Kundalini Pranayama, more popularly known as the Cobra Breath or the Cosmic Cobra Breath. And that technique will change your life guaranteed. I mean, as little as one repetition a day for, for sensitive people, or, you know, seven, 14, you know, up to 108, it will change your life. And that's where I'm talking about when Sunyata said, I don't care who your God is, you do this, you meet him. Because it really is super potent. And, and we call this householder yoga because you don't have eight hours a day, you know, like a, you know, a monk in an ashram to meditate. So, okay, we need to get the same impact or similar impact in 20 minutes a day. You know? And in 20 minutes a day, you can change your life impressively. And then over, you know, once a week, you do more, you know, an hour, 
but this is for householders people who have to pay rent and work jobs and pay taxes and raise children and whatever you still deserve to grow spiritually and so these are practices have been really condensed down the level one classes are to prepare the body prepare yourself emotionally to start moving through you know shining light in the shadow and then um you know and to develop your capacity to move energy because you know what may seem like a lot of energy today if we do these practices properly a year from now it's not going to seem like much energy so you're going to develop incredible capacity your 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 chances to deal with you have to go Geraldine take care love <laughs> ciao ciao <laughs> thanks for coming on um if you do these practices regularly your capacity just like lifting weights your capacity is going to grow so your capacity for energy your capacity to deal with the dramas of life what used to seem super intense is going to be like eh i deal with that all the time now so this is so this is a step-by-step -step process and in normal kriya ashrams it's five years before they, they initiate you into cobra breath and we basically sunyata and i reduced it down to like a year and now I've reduced it even more because, you know, we both decided this was 15 years ago that the world's in a crisis situation and we need to take off some safeguards and, you know, make these change, make these practices more available so that, you know, people can change their consciousness because that's the only solution. And this is the most potent psycho spiritual technique that I know. If I knew of a more potent one, I'd be teaching that. So this is this is top of the line. It really is. Um, and so you know, we decreased it and decreased it and decreased the amount of what you the preparation. So what I like to see is people take the take the introductory class, and then practice those practice. I, I like to say 120 times. It doesn't have to be 120 days in a row. It could be 120 days in a year or 120 days in a year and a half or whatever. But as you do those practices, you're going to experience the results and your energy systems are going to start to open and your emotions are going to start to come up and clear. And this is going to help pre prepare you for the cobra breath and prepare you for that acceleration. It's like learning how to ride, you know, a small horse before you get on the big racehorse. And, uh, and so it's just developing your capacity so that you can step into it and and maintain your equilibrium, you know, even as the changes happen. So this is the process, is the level one classes, which will be in Portugal in person soon. Like the level two is going to be in Austria and then again in, in uh, New York. And then level three, I call multidimensional lovemaking. And it's because in this tantric system, so many people are focused on the sex. And to me, it's like that's the first thing to focus on is developing yourself. Very wise man, as literally his name is Wiseheart, his last name is Wiseheart, said, you know, if you want to be loved, make yourself more lovable. Right? Wow, that hit me, struck me pretty hard. Wow. Become a better person. Don't try to figure out who, the, which, which is what I used to do. Don't try to figure out who the cool people were and then try to act like them. Become a better person. And lo and behold, people like me for who I am. And that was a revolution in itself, you know? And so, so if you want to be loved, make yourself more lovable. You know, how can you connect with someone from your heart? Everybody, want, I want to have better sex. I want to have a better love life. How can you connect with someone from your heart if your heart is closed? How can you connect with someone on the spiritual planes if you haven't accessed that part of your being? So that's why I start with, and I'm, I will always teach ways of take this and you can incorporate it with your partner. Or here's how you incorporate sexual energy to it, even in level one. But you know, once we get through that, you know, level one and then the cobra breath and the kriya yoga initiation, then I teach multidimensional love making. And people can come to that sooner. It's just that the more of these practices you know and the more of your energetic body you develop the more you can make love multi-dimensional but there's nothing that says you can't do that while you're doing the other practices so i start with just to create a yoga meditation practices then i go to cobra breath and then i go to multi-dimensional learning 
So there'll be one of those in Austria in, um, in October. And um, yeah, that's, it's, it sounds simple, but it's because it is, you know, we try to make, we tend to make things more complicated than they are. And so this is just about, here's some tools. How motivated are you? Because I'm here to support you, you know, in whatever it is you want to do. Okay. And if anybody has a question, you're welcome to type it in. All right, my friends. Katharina, I will be in touch. <laughs> Thank you, everyone else, for coming to the initial inaugural online satsang. Always be yourself. You are beautiful, made just to be you. Mm. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> Martin. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you both. Thank you all. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> be well.